So welcome and thank you for joining us for the larger conversation, The Rearview Mirror of Queerness and Erasure, which is a public program that the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum is doing in relation to the exhibition, Boston's Apollo, Thomas McKellar and John Singer Sargent. I'm Michelle Groey and I am the Curator of Education at the Gardner Museum. And um, again, thank you and welcome for joining us. Before we get started, I wanted to be sure to include um, a land acknowledgement. And um, so, although we are virtual today, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum sits is the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people and would like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. So for today's conversation, we are joined by, uh, or with Daniel Corral and Theo Tyson. And um, Daniel, would you go first just in introducing yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Daniel. Um, I'm right now recording from Los Angeles, California, where I'm from, visiting uh, family. And my uh, practice is in the fine art photography realm. I currently work for the Boston Ballet as a box office associate and on furlough, which is why I'm spending time with family in Los Angeles. Great. And how about you, Theo? Uh, my name is Theo. I'm the Polly Thayer Star Fellow in American Art and Culture at the Boston Athenaeum, which is a curatorial role and I work on exhibitions, education, engagement. Great, and thank you both for joining this conversation today. I'm looking forward to it. So Theo, let's stay with you. What drew you to working in and with museums and what has your experience in Boston been like? What drew me to working with museums is when I went back to, for graduate studies, I was trying to decide exactly what direction I wanted to go in. I'd had my own business for several years, almost two decades in event production, specializing in fashion shows, entertainment, but I really wanted to stick with fashion. I made a visit to an exceptional Vivian Westwood presentation at the SCAD Museum of Art and had the experience of the big crocodile tear that comes down your eye when you're looking at something. And I said, I want to be able to take my knowledge of fashion and have this type of impact on someone. Um, how that connects to Boston and being a part of all of this is John Singer, Sargent's Madame X and the fashion contained in that painting was one of my first introductions to how I could have these conversations about identity and class and all of these other sociocultural issues, but start with fashion. Um, Boston was never quite on my radar in regards to one of the places I would move to. I'm here by way of Atlanta, where I was for 20 years. Um, I spent some of that time at the Spelman College Museum of Fine Art and at the SCAD Fash Museum of Fashion and Film. So I was always at a university museum. So again, that educational part and interpretation, sharing stories uh, was compelling. So when I had the opportunity to move to Boston, which I understood would be a challenging city, um, a bit of a culture shock, if you will, and definitely a climate shock from Atlanta, I took advantage of it. Great, thank you. And Daniel, how about you? Um, what drew me to work with museums was uh, my internship that I got with the Gardner Museum. Um, I was the Polythea Star uh, Studio intern for the year of uh, 2016 through 2017 um, with Brian Hone. And I began to, to investigate it. it's uh, the museum's connection with the audience and how I can fit in that role. I began um, I began starting to do uh, studio programming with Brian um, started to develop ways that art can relate to people and how museums fit in that um, in that space where where people can attend museums and uh, begin to process art a little differently um, I was more interested in how people uh, process that and and connect my own body of work 
um, in that conversation as well. So um, that internship really sparked an interest in, in museums and working with museums and uh, moving forward to the exhibition that I have uh, currently at the at the Garden Museum on their art wall um, is something that I think merges my world of photography and visual arts as well as a conversation broader about um, queerness, my identity as a queer Latinx um, individual um, and, and hoping to, to continue that line of work uh, in whatever city I'm in um, currently in, in Los Angeles and we'll see how, how that plays out. Great, thank you. Do you want? Would you like to say a few, a little bit more about the the installation that you have on the art wall at the Gardner Museum right now? Yes, uh, it was very much on on theme with uh, the conversations we're going to be having today. Um, the theme is about uh, self reflecting and picturing yourself in spaces that you might not often see yourself in. Um, it, I think it's very really, very heavily on folks that feel um, either misrepresented or or have no representation or um, uh, have often feel that I have no space in a museum setting. Um, I kind of flipped the narrative and because I was invited by the museum, I took the initiative and just photographed myself wherever wherever I felt most comfortable, wherever I felt most myself in the work that is being represented by the museum um, and myself as an individual. And those self-reflections kind of cement the fact that I, a queer brown body, have taken space in, in this museum and there is evidence of it as such. And I'm hoping that other folks uh, that view that body of work can also uh, share that sentiment begin to post their own their own photos um, in in these heavily populated usually um, elitist or white dominating space that are museums but you know have have more of a self represent self representation in that fantastic thank you so much and um, so Theo, could you describe briefly what your relationship with the Gardner Museum was prior to the Boston's Apollo exhibition? My relationship was really as a guest and a visitor. Uh, again, I'm the Polly Thayer Star Fellow at the Boston Athenaeum, so we share that relationship with the Polly Thayer Star Trust with the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. So one of the trustees invited me over to meet some of the artists and residents. It was, um, I've only been in Boston for a little over a year. So this was when I first moved and trying to really just sink my teeth into the cultural landscape of Boston as quickly as possible and wanting to meet artists, um, fellow museum educators, curators, et cetera. Um, and so that was my first introduction. And then I found out about the amazing concert series. Um, and so that kept bringing me back and there were these wonderful exhibitions, but it was really the, the warm welcome from the team at the Gardner and just being interested in my interest. And that's what led me to Boston's Apollo. It was listening and, and sharing about what this experience in Boston could be for someone that is a black lesbian curator transplanted from Atlanta into a city that has this storied history of LGBT history, of slavery, anti-slavery, all of these different narratives that I had not experienced in the same way in the South. And so coming into, coming into the Gardner Museum, understanding the history of my institution, this institution, all of the other institutions in Boston. That was really how I couldn't stop coming back. Um, and I won't make any mentions about Cafe G. It's, 
Good. Okay. You can if you would like, but <laughs> I think that, um, no, that's great. Like you said, as, as someone who's new to Boston and just getting a sense of what, what the city has to offer and what the cultural institutions are working on. And that's, um, no, it's great to mention that we connect with the museum in different ways um, or had prior to this project. Um, so great. So one of the, one of the big, uh, pause. One of the biggest ways in which this exhibition is, is a new approach for the Gardner Museum is that we um, approached the planning process, particularly for interpretation and programming, in a very different way. So um, in, typically exhibitions have one, one or two main curators or co-curators that do the majority of the research and then work with um, and come up with the thesis and the concepts for the show and working uh, collaboratively with, with various staff, whether it's education programmers, marketing, various folks across the museum to bring the exhibition to fruition. And for this exhibition, when we uh, first started planning it a few years ago, I think even back in 20, 2017, it was clear that, um, the, that because of the type of material that is in the exhibition that we needed to think about and, and really uh, approach this work in a different way, and both you, Theo and Daniel, have been active collaborators in this process, um, which we did the bulk of throughout the calendar year of 2019. So as we were getting closer to the exhibition, uh, which opened in February of 2000, 2020 or 2020, um, we started to work together with a group of community collaborators to really dig deeper into the themes and issues of the exhibition. And uh, like I said, working more collaboratively to, um, to feature multiple perspectives around this material and to really draw to the surface and to highlight some of these really complex and critical issues that the material and the research had, had um, brought to light. So just thinking back to when we started that work last, last spring in 2019, um, so you both, you, you were invited to participate in this process, but you still had a choice if you were going to do that or not. So I'm wondering if, if you both could talk about why you chose to participate in the Boston's Apollo exhibition, and also if you could reflect on what your first thoughts were when you were presented with the exhibition idea and material. Theo, would you like to go first? Um, sure. Um, I, I know you said that we, we definitely had a choice um, in accepting the invitation, but I can honestly say that when you have an opportunity to use your voice in this way, it's really not a choice. Um, going back to one of the reasons that I really wanted to get involved in museum work was that interpretive storytelling and making sure that marginalized identities, underrepresented communities, that their stories and their lived experiences were being archived and shared as well. So there, there was no, it was an immediate yes upon invitation and, and being presented with the full scope of the idea, even before seeing the drawings, again, just having a, a general familiarity with, with Sargent's work it was almost a relief, um, kind of a, a finally, here's an opportunity to divert the white male gaze and focus it on something that is more inclusive and more inclusive, making it more accurate and not leaving out these conversations on queerness, on race, on class, not leaving this stuff out and not just leaving it at Sargent as an amazing painter. There's more to the story than that. The murals in the MFA are beautiful, but who's behind them? And not just the artists behind them. Um, so that was my first thought was, finally, we get to truly, people always use the phrasing unpack when they talk about art and exhibition. To me, this is one of the first times that I've truly seen an effort to unpack a body of work, including the artist biography, including the the cultural components of the time, looking at it historically and contemporarily. Great, thank you. And Daniel, what about you? So I had very similar thoughts and just gonna uh, piggyback on what Theo said, um, because I think it's very important to be, to be critical as a participant of 
going to museums and looking at artwork. It's one of my favorite things to do. I, I have a critical eye as soon as I enter a space. It's not just the work that I'm looking at. It's the environment that, that holds such work. Um, and so I had a vague understanding of uh, McKellar and Sargent um, before hearing about Boston's Apollo and the entire exhibition. Um, you know, as a, as a museum school uh, student, I, I frequently went to the MFA and I, st I saw the portrait of uh, Thomas McKellar by Sargent and I, I knew deep down that there was more to the story that uh, needs to be unpacked. Uh, viewing the rotunda, I think was was really evident because he Sergeant um, McKellar is all over, and for me it was kind of like a no brainer uh, after being invited that I wanted to be a, a a part of this, even though I felt like I wasn't the the perfect fit for for this kind of conversation. Um, I, I mean specifically that I could only talk about my experience um, as a queer brown body and Miss McKellar being a, a black body, um, presumably uh, queer. I, I'm going to still hold, out, hold on to that assumption. And I felt like I wasn't, I wasn't the right fit, but in some way, I wanted to show allyship for other queer bodies that don't identify with McKellar, um, to show allyship and, and acknowledge that even though I am not uh, completely represented by Thomas McKellar, I understand a lot about uh, leaving one's home is something that we discovered uh, with the exhibition. Um, I thought discovering your identity through modeling and portraiture. Um, all those all those things uh, really hit the nail for me and on why I wanted to participate and to speak about queerness as as a queer individual. Um, it, it, yeah, it was a no brainer. I, I felt I still think that museums um, need to have a, a, a stronger input in the exhibitions that they put out. And I think this community collaboration is just an example of how how things can be done um, when you consider all aspects of, of a piece. Um, because as, as Theo said, everyone knows a John Seeker Sargent, everyone knows this, this master painter, but little less known is Thomas McKellar. And the fact that this story is being, is being told now through uh, the museum as an institution and community collaborators um, I think is, is quite telling and, and kind of sets the standard and I absolutely wanted to be a part of this process. Great, thank you. So I realize um, I realize I probably want to insert this late earlier in the recording, but um, that Boston's Apollo, Thomas McKellar and John Singer Sargent is uh, the bulk of the artwork that's on view are a set of drawings, a portfolio of drawings that Jack, John Singer Sargent gifted to Isabella Stewart Gardner. And the majority of the artworks are uh, drawings of the black model, Thomas McKellar, that were created by John Singer Sargent, as well as additional research that we were able to, to find um, about Thomas McKellar and who his life, or, sorry, who he is and what his life was like, including uh, finding his last living relative um, and getting her perspective on the research that we found as well with um, Deirdre O'Brien. And um, just so much that we learned about Thomas as a person, um, not just in relationship to, to John Singer Sargent in this work, but just his, his story, what was his story. And as we were sharing the different type of research that we had un uncovered and starting to share what those, um, just those ideas as we started to, to discuss it as a collaborative group, um, each of you were bringing up different themes that you thought would be really important to address either both in the interpretation as well as um, other ways or other stories that we could feature, whether it's through social media or programs. Could um, Daniel, you from, I remember from the community conversation as a group, one of your first responses was this, was this idea of queerness and connecting with that. 
Could you say a little bit about, um, you started to a little bit, could you say, um, was there something in particular about the drawings um, or the material or what you heard that we had uncovered that brought this to mind for you as a, as a big theme that we should address? Yeah, um, so one of the, the immediate things for me that, that I saw and, and why my mind just thought um, uh, queer um, was how, how McKellar was represented uh, by Sargent and I think most of that was being drawn from McKellar and not Sargent the artist who, who um, drew McKellar. And what I mean by that is McKellar had had as much say in his in his positioning of his body, and and how his body is represented. And to me, as a as a male identifying uh, body, I felt that uh, some of these things some of these things I feel like I can connect to, and some of these things I think are a little bit less so. Um, and it, and it it was represented through um, soft touches that uh, McKellar had embraced, or a very like statuesque uh, female body representation. Um, and you see that in the rotunda, how McKellar posed for both male and female bodies. And I think that idea is so inherently queer um, that a, a body, someone, an individual posing for another, another individual could be male, could be female, I think is, is inherently queer um, because there's some, there's some ambiguity in that. And I, I think I, I talk a lot, I wrote about this in my write-up about queerness is the uh, unknowing that whether or not that was a female being represented in, in the rotunda, uh, a female body or a male body, the ambiguity in that I think is so interesting in how it doesn't matter. Ultimately, it doesn't matter who whose body that was, it's it's how we perceive it. And I also, I also feel like McKellar enjoyed the process as much as uh, a sergeant did and and then this uh, this act of of modeling and taking taking the male gaze but sort of working with it I feel like uh, McKellar in this in this process uh, found more of himself and 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 that representation is shown through very uh, muscular masculine illustrations or very soft feminine. Um, I, I, I don't mean to uh, stereotype strong masculinity and soft femininity. femininity. Um, I just think one, it's how our, our brains operate and, and I want to just quickly acknowledge that, but also acknowledge that it doesn't matter how the body is represented and that ambiguity I think is is amazing and something to appreciate. Great and so could you describe briefly when you use the word the term queer queer or queerness what that how you define that? Yeah um, I, I, I love this question. <laughs> um, so the queerness to me I think is something that uh, stands out from the norm. I think society uh, norms are heterosexuality, a man and a woman, and um, the, the very uh, stereotypical sense of what a man and a woman looks like. And queerness as a, as a whole shatters that binary uh, train of thought. Uh, queerness is other, is it, um, I think the queerness it, itself and, and the representation of queerness is something that is othered and unique. And Thomas McKellar uh, embracing a feminine and masculine representation, I, I think is othered. I, I and here's where I can speak to myself. My representation as a male uh, 
identifying body is is so inherently wrapped up in, in that but I also choose and and I try to represent uh, my body in a more f uh, feminine gaze because I'm comfortable with my body being represented as such um, and and you know it goes down to to uh, aesthetics how one chooses to wear and um, I think it, it's it's definitely othered, but it's a, a representation of other that breaks the binary structure of what a uh, man and woman um, is represented. Great, thank you. And so just to follow up with that, um, so Daniel, you've talked in other conversations at the museum in regards to this exhibition that the body of images we have were a collaboration between Sargent and McKellar and refer to these images as a queering of the male gaze. And the male gaze in art history is historically or traditionally has inherently um, involved objectifying or of the subject or objectifying of its subject, and it historically has been white heterosexual cisgendered um, art from the artist's point of view. And do you think that McKellar and John Singer Sargent were equal in their collaboration? No, uh, okay. to to put it uh, bluntly. Um, I think I think there was uh, something to gain from both Sargent and, and McKellar um, in terms of equal uh, collaboration. Sargent gained so much more than than McKellar um, in this in his body of work. Um, but I think it's also important to point out in that conversation is that you have Sargent who was already successful very uh, in control of the situation with Thomas McKellar and McKellar to me as someone who uh, can gain a little bit more from an interaction such as uh, modeling for for uh, Sargent a few times I think uh, what was gained was self-identity and um, power within within Thomas McKellar's own self and and his body but did he have final say absolutely not I think this was Sergeant McKellar's uh, project from from start to finish and, and and why I don't see it as as it being equal um, I think I think also uh, Thomas McKellar Thomas McKellar knew that this was not an equal partnership. Um, I, I say that um, I say that believing that because of the, the power struggles that we face today uh, and the power struggles that I believe Thomas McKellar uh, faced back then, I don't think in any way this was an equal partnership um, but I think that Thomas McKellar and even even me uh, thinking about how how my employment kind of keeps me uh, locked in and in, in a in a, the position that I'm in which is uh, artists getting by having to work uh, full-time to make ends meet that that narrative of of the artists, I think, is something that maybe Thomas McKellar uh, lived by, left home, worked, and is is uh, trying to make ends meet. Here comes along an opportunity, and I think Thomas McKellar ran with it. I don't think anyone would uh, think twice about it because, it, of course, it's something to gain. Um, it, it's an opportunity to express yourself and gain hopefully gained, gained something. And I think Thomas McKellar gained um, self-representation and power uh, through this as much as humanly possible, because as I said, McK uh, Sargent hold, held the power in this. Um, but, but yeah, there was a, a collaboration involved and I think they both gained something, but it was not equal. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. So I'm gonna um, pivot to Theo. So Theo, for, um, for a lot of, um, so I think a lot, like many of us, there were so many thoughts that I think I know you had about this material. 
And one of the themes that, that really stood out strongly to you is this concept of erasure. So I wondered if you could talk um, a little bit about um, why that theme kept coming up for you so much and, and how you would define erasure in this context as well. Um, well, I think what Daniel just said is one of the reasons erasure stood out so much because it's it was blatant. When you walk into the MFA and look up at the rotunda, you see white gods and goddesses. And we now know that to be the body of a black man. And so that is an absolute erasure and the definitive definition of the word as if you were to take something that you know is there and you're trying to make it go away. It is something that you do with intent and it's something that you do with effort. And with, with Daniel's acknowledgement of the, the intimacy that was necessary to create such works of art, the time that was necessary, the time, the time on both their parts that they spent together at, in a period in our history where the idea of a black man going into the home or studio of especially a wealthy white man in Boston was almost unheard of. Um, there were challenges in with you know the construction of the the 54th monument with with um, Robert Gould Shaw because they couldn't get black artists to sit because they were so fearful because of this history of black men being kidnapped for scientific experiment and so on and so forth. So we know that there was a connection of some sort between the two of them, and for Sargent to erase McKellar literally from history. We don't see him when we look up at the rotunda in the MFA. And then to do so gesturally and figuratively by keeping these drawings hidden, by it not being an equal collaboration, by speaking very in a very derogatory and racist manner about McKellar in a way discrediting the validity of what he offered him as an artist. And I really think that in talking about erasure, it's reframing the artist model and muse and reevaluating what that relationship looks like in the sense of collaboration and the sense of equity. And in doing so in a situation like Thomas McKellar and John Singer Sargent, there are, there are areas of race and gender and class identity and sexuality that we can't ignore. And we're looking at how these two individuals were both hoping for an opportunity to really perform their identity to the best of their ability. And one could not do it without the other. But as Daniel mentioned earlier, Sargent clearly profited more than McKellar did. And that was intentional because he erased him from this artistry. No, it's a great point. I mean, especially in New England, there's a lot of John Singer Sargent artwork in institutional collections, or he's almost part of the visual vernacular, if you if you will, um, here mm -hmm. in this area. And he's very well known for um, high society portraits that are, I think, for the most part, are white, wealthy individuals or their family members. So this type of material is very different than, and as you said, the drawings are capturing Thomas is a black man, and then they're they're erased or transformed into what they become for the the final murals at the MFA. Um, one of the lines in your in your label about erasure really stands out, Theo, and where you say that mm -hmm. one of the many dehumanizing practices of chattel slavery was the parceling and selling of black bodies on the auction block. And I'm wondering if you can say just a little bit about why it was important to frame this issue in this way. I think it was important to frame the issue in this way because it it required that historical context of why this could be seen as an act of violence. Um, when people say erasure, it shouldn't be that big of a deal. Again, it's reframing the artist model. Yes, he was compensated in some way, um, but these these arguments about what you can do with a human being 
um, this idea of possession, as Daniel mentioned, this idea of control. There's a, another line in the label that, you know, Sergeant renders him, and it's like this, it's a slave-master relationship where it doesn't matter what McKellar gives, Sergeant is the one that's ultimately in control and makes the decision on what to do with McKellar's body. Um, the drawing that I had a chance to respond to, you could visually see the erasure as Thomas McKellar's body is incomplete. Mm -hmm. um, it's him from shoulders to his feet and the upper part of his torso is not shaded in. So you start to see this visual, and it's, again, I went back and forth in trying to figure out how to approach this because it's, is it an erasure of blackness or is it an attempt at an addition of whiteness to talk about this, this queer lens that we can put on a relationship between McKellar and Sargent. So because it's, again, it's a complicated history and I wanted to make sure that we could center it in that history so we would not succumb to arguments of aesthetic and artistic practice. And I guess building on that then is um, there's a lot of, so we're recording this in July of 2020, or excuse me, it's now August of 2020. And um, a lot has happened in the United States of America in the past few weeks and months, um, not just with COVID-19, which is, which is um, reaching all the parts of the globe, but also here in particular, a lot of instances of violence um, and killing, violence against and killing of black and brown people here in, in our country and becoming much more visible uh, very quickly um, when they, after they've occurred this spring. And so given that today's challenges and injustices with, um, with the black community and with black people here in this country right now, why do you believe that McKellar's body and identity are necessary and important for the public to know and understand in the context with this exhibition? Um, for exactly the, the reason that you just sure. said, it's, it's historical. This, this violence against Black bodies is nothing new. What we're doing with Boston's Apollo is looking at how that physical violence that exists in the historical practices of chattel slavery to police brutality, we're looking at how it exists in institutions, in cultural institutions, in, in art, in art history, in historiography. So this was an opportunity to say this isn't isolated. When we look at our, our relationship to this inundation of material and people want to say, well, why is this happening now? this is our opportunity to say again this has been happening for hundreds of years this is just the first opportunity it seems that we've taken to collectively address it um and it's the intention and impact of an artist's work those things matter mm -hmm. so when we think about someone producing a work of art we we hope that they have the best intention for whatever that production is and if they're using human beings to express whatever their artistic vision is, I think that there's, there's a sense of ethics and integrity that, that you would do that person no harm. And I see the erasure of Thomas McKellar by John Singer Sargent as doing that person harm. It should have been a collaboration. It should have been something that was, was honored and revered and it hasn't been. I mean, we talk about so many other muses throughout history of Dega and Picasso and all of these other great artists because we see what the benefit of a muse was to their work. And again, putting this in another context of American history, it's not fair to not cite or discredit Black people for their contributions to our society in all the many forms that it takes shape. And that, no, and, and building on that, that uh, the term you use with artistic integrity, that that's, that's complicated and layered and it has layers and complexity in the time in which Sargent and McKellar were interacting with each other or collaborating or not. And then 
what does that mean for how we tell the story about who each man was, as well as what what this um, intersection and what this collaboration yielded, and the choices that were made by both by each of them in that too. Um, great, thank you. So, is there are there any last thoughts that either one of you would like to share about this exhibition or something that you learned along the way that um, that we might not have been talked about yet that you think um, would just be helpful to reflect on right now? I, I have something uh, in my own practice as a, as a photographer and thinking about uh, agency and, and collaboration. Um, and part of that, I think, is acknowledging when I've had uh, complete power over over individuals. And I started to examine that a lot more in, in my own work. There was a, a work that I, a body work I wanted to continue here in Los Angeles um, about uh, street vendors and uh, immigrant, immigrant workers um, and the possibilities for them in, in a in a city like Los Angeles, where anything is possible, it's the land land of dreams. I think as I move forward with that body of work, how how I, an individual, you know, with status and agency as a photographer, approach those spaces to a community that I once thought of as as my own. But realizing all the layers and all the intersections where there is an, an otherness to them and and as I navigate those spaces uh, best practices and with you know complete best intentions and best practices in mind how to best navigate that space and continue my body of work without uh, taking power away from another individual or another community it, this exhibition has made me reflect on all bodies of work, um, myself in, included, and moving forward, it will continue to do so. Theo, how about for you? I think the last thing that I would say is really, as audiences, being very intentional on how we enter into museum spaces and again this idea of consumption and consuming the artworks that are on view what that actually means to consume them and what we're consuming how it's being fed to us how digestible is it um i, I want to i want to encourage people to ask those questions of of any exhibition, of any artist, of any work of art, any curator, any institution. Again, I think that what happened with, with the interpretations of the community collaborators with Boston's Apollo is a model that should be applauded because the entire intent of art, not just for art's sake, is discourse. It's to have a place to express those things that we can't express otherwise so that we can figure out a way to have conversations about them. And I think by pointing out all of the different points of entry, not all of them, but the ones that stood out the most to us, all of the different points of entry, all of the different themes for Boston's Apollo, from race, class, gender, identity, sexuality, letting people know essentially that everyone has a place in this conversation and again, that idea of why did we choose to accept the invitation to participate in this, it wasn't a choice. And this is about making sure that everyone has a voice in these conversations that affect the way that we view the constructs that we live in in society. Absolutely. Um, thank you both so much for sharing your reflections. And also thank you for collaborating with us on this exhibition and telling these stories from different angles because it it was not something that we could do without your and other voices and perspectives and um i agree i think it it ends up it, the show is 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 what it is because of those collaborations and because of of prioritizing um that approach so thank you and um 
thank you again for this conversation um, and for reflecting with us today about your experiences and working with this show. And um, yes, we hope that um, we hope that from now until October, that as many um, as many of you watching come in and, and check out the exhibition at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. And if it's past October, then we hope that you can take a closer look at the exhibition um, materials on our website. And we hope that um, you continue to join us for these critical and complex conversations about different issues, both in art of the past as well as, as in today. And um, thank you again. And thank you again for our sponsors for their generous support of the exhibition and programs as well. So thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Yes, you're welcome. No, thank you.